let's dive into a whole new world of nanomaterials. So tiny, tiny materials and engineering that we're doing at, you know, scale smaller than you can even see. This is research coming out of Texas A&M, and what they're doing is finding a way to detect if there are nanoparticles in the food that you're eating. And that sounds scary, and it can be a little bit, but I want to say, you know, you don't have to be scared about nanoparticles everywhere. There's a lot of great applications of nanoengineering. Um, and basically what that means is, if you think of how thin a sheet of paper is, 100,000 times thinner than that, that's how small a nanoparticle is. And there are applications for engineering at that scale in the medical realm, in the materials realm, in the electronics realm, and even in agriculture. So, you know, engineering at a level that small is making vast improvements and revolutions in a lot of aspects of our lives. And it's becoming more widespread. But we also have some questions about it because when materials are at that scale that small they perform a lot differently in the nano scale than we expect them to you know in the macro scale that we interact with them every day in real life i i love whenever we talk about a nano topic because this hits home for us we did our research on it we're passionate about it but i feel like we've never actually talked about like nanoparticles and what happens at that scale so just for some context for our audience that might not be familiar what i thought was cool when i first started learning about nanotechnology and nanomaterials is that as you get smaller and smaller normal material properties start to change so for example gold at the nanoscale is no longer gold in color but rather red and it has a strange property where it binds um it binds very strongly with cancer cells so it can be used as like a torpedo to gather around tumors and cancer cells and point out to the medical professionals where they should attack or glass glass turns bouncy at the at the nanoscale instead of being this fragile thing that just cracks right away so in, in, in the same fashion, you have these interesting properties that we're still like learning about, and we're not sure if some of them could be carcinogens, if they could be bad for us, like the whole graphene debacle that happened in Canada with COVID, where they had made graphene face masks, and one of the side effects was that people started having respiratory issues with it. Yeah, so all that to say, you don't have to be scared of nanoparticles. They're doing great things, but we do have to be cautious of them and try to fully understand how they might affect us because at the nanoscale, things perform a lot differently than we'd expect them to in real life. So um, what these researchers from Texas A&M, their civil engineering department are doing is they developed a machine learning model that used a bunch of data that has already been collected in previous experience about how many nanoparticles are present, present in certain types of produce along with different concentrations and maybe whether they're in the roots or up in the shoots or the leaves of the plant. So using previous research from other researchers, they can stand on the shoulders of those giants and use this machine learning model to estimate how many nanoparticles are assuming are going to be accumulating um, in different certain types of plants based on what soil they grow in, how much they're watered, um, how much water the roots suck up, and what time of year they're being grown in. All these different factors can help them predict, um, you know, given any certain type of produce that you might be consuming, how many nanoparticles are in it. So and, j just to like put this into the context of safety, are they doing this to understand what the concentration and what type of nanoparticles are found in specific uh, produce and if that concentration is dangerous to us? So they're not specifically detecting right now whether that concentration is dangerous. Okay. And they're not even looking at certain types of nanoparticles because there are way, way, way too many. Um, That's what they talk saying. about even if there's, even if you just said, I want to think about silver nanoparticles. Right. Silver nanoparticles perform differently and they have a bunch of different shapes and sizes that act differently. They basically say there's way too many permutations for them to be able to track specific hazardous nanoparticles. But what they are doing is giving people who do that type of research a tool to understand what concentration gotcha. is you know, in a certain type of produce using a certain type of agricultural method. And if a researcher down the road says, hey, you really need to be careful about gold particle concentrations above a certain level, you can use this machine learning model to predict how, might, how much there might be in a certain type of produce and warn people about that or change the type of agricultural method you're using to use something that's a little safer and doesn't accumulate quite as many nanoparticles. That totally makes sense. And I, and I love that they see themselves as creating a tool to help out a different team. I love these collaborative efforts. 
And, and it's it's really a great way for these researchers, you know, in the civil engineering department, they're not necessarily, you know, biomedical engineers to understand how it's interacting with the human body. And they're not necessarily agricultural engineers to understand why these nanoparticles are being used in fertilizers and stuff like that. But what they do have a really great grasp on is how and where water transfers and where how and where soil transfers and how that impacts crops. And the, so they're dealing with their expertise to find the best way to help this larger problem and maybe we won't call it a problem but a question mark around how nanoparticles are being you know accumulated and consumed by us and how they might affect us i, I love these type of researchers that investigate nanoparticle interactions with human beings and the environment because there's there's been so many advancements in what we can do with nanotechnology but not necessarily how it affects us but now that we have this closed loop we can use the information of how it affects the environment to make sure whatever we're developing is in line with our best interests and the environment's best interests. So kudos to the team. I'm happy that they're actually taking on this initiative and I wish them the best of luck. I am as well.